morning, everybody. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church. Hey, I want to remind you that we have a bulletin for you if you want to go ahead and scan that code or go to bulletin.mountvernonfirst.org uh, so you can follow along. We hope you were able to find some way to worship last week as we were sidelined with COVID-19 and had to cancel our services. And we appreciate your prayers. I think we're all feeling pretty good. Um, so we're healing and we're out of quarantine. And speaking of COVID-19, our bishop has strongly recommended that we limit all our church activities to groups of 10 people or less except for worship services. And that means that our youth programs are going to be canceled uh, in person until further notice. Um, for my youth, I'm going to try and figure out something to keep connected. Um, I know Gina's been working on some stuff as well. So just so everybody knows, youth groups are canceled for the time being until we can meet in larger groups. And speaking of groups of 10 people or less, the Salvation Army Kettle Campaign is ramping up, and it's happening very soon. So be sure to sign up so you can ring some bells. You can sign up online at mountvernonfirst.info, uh, or you can go to the Welcome Center just right around the corner out here, uh, and you can sign up on that sign-up sheet as well. You can find a link to all of this in your first things email. Um, and 90% of the proceeds are given back to help Angels on Assignment help other people in Jefferson County. So as uh, we speak about bells that are ringing, Christmas is also around the corner. And that means that we're going to need some help decorating the church for Advent. Uh, so if you're interested in helping decorate, please contact Lynn Jackman. Her phone number is also in the first things email. Um, so I hope you liked all my smooth transitions. Uh, and my bigger hope is that you are ready to worship this morning. So I want to invite you into worship with these words. Through the week of stress and demands, we come to you this day, O Lord. Awaken us again to your comforting and loving presence in our lives. Help us to be open to the many ways in which you have called to us and sustained us. Make us ready to be of service to you. Amen. I want to invite you to stand if you're able as we join in the hymn, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Now, before you're seated here in the sanctuary, take a moment to wave or greet those around you in some uh, nonverbal way. Can you do that? All right.
I could chase after greatness, first to fall on my knees, lose myself to be found where you want me. I could do all the right things, sing the words till they bleed, but I know it's just noise if I don't have love. So I won't waste my breath if it's not for love. I don't have the heart if it's not for love. Don't let me say it's faith if it counts no cost. Cause there's no fear in love, but there is a cross. I could speak like the angels, prophesy knowing all. I could live with the faith to move mountains. Should I die like a martyr, give my wealth to the poor? It would all scream loud nothing if I don't have love. So I won't waste my breath if it's not for love. I don't have the heart if it's not for love. Don't let me say it's faith if it counts no cost. Cause there's no fear in love, but there is a cross. Thank you so much, Ashley. Ashley's on overtime because she led our contemporary service earlier, and we're glad she can share in this service today as well. Before we uh, go to God in prayer, we do want to extend our sympathy, our love, and our prayers to Julie Hoffman and all of her family upon the death of her mother, Ada Heller, this past week down in Murfreesboro. And Dennis tells me there'll be a, a small family graveside service this Tuesday. So remember the Hoffman and Heller families in your prayers. Uh, also, keep in mind those who are uh, affected by COVID, who are sick, ill, positive. A uh, number of folks in our church this past week, I know, have contracted it. And we want to uh, remember them in our prayers each day. Now, on a personal note, I want to acknowledge that there are, uh, all, there are flowers placed here at the altar by yours truly, uh, celebrating 28 years of marriage to Jennifer yesterday. So for 28 years, she has suffered uh, with me, but uh, now here, here's your trivia for the, for the day. Do you know who the uh, choir director and organist and pianist at my wedding was? Kathy Just. Yeah, so we've, we've gone full circle with each other. Let's uh, bow our heads now and spend a moment uh, of time in prayer with God.
We call upon you, O God, remembering that you are a source of unity and not division. You are a source of love and hope and blessing, and you're not the author of hatred or despair or harm. In this world we live in right now is so full of anger and negativity and antipathy that it's, it's hardly escapable. Even in this great land of freedom and opportunity, brother and sister turn against brother and sister over differences in politics and politicians, disagreements due to race and class, major disputes over minor and really inconsequential matters. We fall so short and we settle for so little, O oh God, when we really know that life is found in you and you alone. No politician can bring the peace we need deeply within our hearts. No political party can create the healing that we need in our relationships and in our land. What we need, God, is you. We need the salvation and the reconciliation that you alone can bring into our lives and into our world. Help us to know your peace in these troubled times and use us as peacemakers in this troubled, divided world. We offer you our prayers and concerns for many who are facing significant struggles this day, those who are physically ill and, and particularly those who are ill from COVID. We pray for those grieving the death of someone they love. We pray for those whose emotions and mental health are impaired by isolation and by loneliness. Help us to trust you during these difficult times, Lord. Replace our fear with hope our doubt and worry with faith, our despair with trust in your never-ending love. For we place ourselves into your care, O oh God, knowing and remembering that you are Alpha and Omega, you are our beginning and our end. And all of this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we pray now the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, my friends, we missed everyone last week. As, as we've noted, several of us on the church staff uh, were exposed to COVID a couple of weeks ago, and we each were ill, uh, displaying various symptoms to varying degrees. But I'm glad to say that today we are well and we're out of quarantine, and I'm so glad we can be back together and worship today, some of you in person, some of you uh, online. Uh, thanks to Ian, who was scheduled to preach last Sunday, uh, so we just fast-forwarded and let him preach today, and that gave me an opportunity to catch up on charge conference paperwork uh, that I'd left at the last minute and was able to get that completed, so I appreciate Ian preaching today. You should all know the routine by now. Uh, we really want to encourage you to fill out the online attendance registration form, whether you're local or whether you're far away. Uh, you can get to that by letting your smartphone camera focus on that QR code that's on the screen. Uh, either now or later, you can go into your web browser and go to attend.mountvernonfirst.org. I've said this before, but uh, let's remember we are not so disconnected that you can't pick up the phone and call us if you need to update us on something going on in your life or if you have concern for someone else. Um, so thank you for all the ways you stay connected and especially for completing that online form. Uh, for those who are in the sanctuary, remember we have offering plates at various stations around, around the room. Uh, anyone also can give by going to giving.mountvernonfirst.org. On your smartphone, you can either text to give or give through the app that we have, and you can mail in your gifts to 1133 Main Street here in Mount Vernon. You have remained so faithful to God during this pandemic with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, and we thank you once more for all that you do and continuing to bear witness to the hope in Jesus Christ in this community and beyond. So I invite you now to join me in a prayer over our offerings. Could we pray? Lord of blessings and hope, we give to you these gifts as tokens of our lives. 
Use these gifts for healing and hope in your world. And use us as instruments of peace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a great Sunday. Um, before I talk to the children, I do want to announce that, as Ian mentioned, we are being very strongly encouraged to cancel any gatherings of 10 or more. Um, we had scheduled, or I had scheduled, a movie Wednesday afternoon in here with a lesson. And fortunately, I have more than 10 children in my group. So therefore, we are going to have to cancel that. So we will not meet this Wednesday on November 18th for the movie Lesson in Popcorn. We're going to do our best to keep everyone safe and well. And as soon as the COVID cases drop down and it's safe, we will have a movie day. Okay. Well, when I was a kid, I loved the song, This Little Light of Mine. It was, it was one of my all-time favorites. I still kind of like to sing it. I'm sure you've all heard it. You know, it goes, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It goes on to say, I will not hide my under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Well, Jesus once told a story uh, about a master and his three servants. He said the master was getting ready to go on a long trip and he gave, called in three servants and he gave each one of them something of value. Back then in biblical times, they called them talents. It meant that it was possibly silver or gold, but it had a value to it. Uh, he gave the first man five talents. He gave the second man two and the third man he gave just one. And after a long, long trip, he came home and he called all three men back in and he said, what did you do with the talents that I gave each of you? And the first one said, well, you gave me five and I worked real hard and I earned five more. So now I have a total of 10. And the second guy said, well, I took the two you gave me and I invested them and I was very smart, used my brain, and now I have a total of four. Both men doubled. So the master told him, well, that was a really good job. You did really well. What did you do, he said to the third man. And the third man said, well, I was afraid. I didn't want to lose what you gave me. So I just dug a hole, buried it, and hid it so no one could get it. My talent. And I still have it. And the master said, well, that's not what I wanted you to do with what I have given you. That, you were just lazy and irresponsible. Now, why would Jesus tell a story like that? Well, in today's world, when we say someone has a talent, what we mean is, is they have a gift for doing something, and they do it well. And I think just a little part of what Jesus is trying to teach us in this parable is that we all have gifts or talents. Some of us are gifted in schoolwork. Some of us sing or play a musical instrument. Some are great listeners. Maybe others are good leaders, or maybe you're one of those people who can tell a really good story. But you can bring your talents and gifts to bring joy to the other people in your life. Now, for most of my life, I wondered why God had left me out in the gift and the talent line. I, I just knew I had been in the wrong line when they were handing those out, and I missed my opportunity. I had friends who could sing, others who were good listeners. I have one friend who's the most patient person you have ever met. And I have another friend who tells hilarious stories and just makes you laugh constantly. Well, I sat around and I whined a lot about why didn't I get any of those gifts? I wanted some of those gifts. And then one day my friend Becky, who, can, who could sing really beautifully, told me she sure wished she could cook for a lot of people the way I did. She said, you can cook for two or three hundred people as easily as I do it for five or six. And if I could do what you do, I'd invite everybody over to my house. We'd have this great big fancy meal. We would all sit around and visit and talk about all the wonderful go things God has done for us. But it shocked me. I was flabbergasted that she would want to be like me when I just wanted to be like her. Um, I was burying a talent that God had given me and I wasn't using it to bless other people. 
And it was a really valuable lesson that I learned that day. Now, each of you has a gift or a talent, or maybe you have many gifts and talents that can bring joy to others if you'll just use them wisely. What are your talents? What gifts have you buried away that you're not using that you could use for God's glory? Well, this week, why don't we dig them up, dust them off, and we'll use them to bring joy to others. What could you do this week to spread kindness and the love of God in someone else's life? Let's pray about that and see what we can do this coming week. Dear God, we know you don't want us to hide our light away from the world. Help us and guide us this week as we work to spread your love and kindness to others. Amen. I got extra things to turn on today. Um, we're doing a sermon over the phone thing, and to do that, we have to use a voice recorder. And I've never seen one of these in my life. Um, I'm too young for these things, so I'm trying to figure that out. Let's see if it works this time. All right. So today we're learning about a message from Paul. Uh, it's going to be First Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through eight. Here's what it says. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you, that is the Apostles Paul, Timothy, and Silas coming to the church in Thessalonica, our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, a town they'd previously planted a church, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came to you with words of flattery or a pretext for greed. 
nor did we seek praise from mortals or whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. I chose this scripture way back on October 30th, uh, before we were sidelined with all this COVID stuff. And to be honest with you, when I returned to it this week, I had no idea why I chose the scripture. I read over the text on Tuesday, and I started to doubt if I could pull anything relevant out to give you guys on Sunday. And I read these eight verses, isolated from the rest of the text first, to see if anything popped out. Nothing happened. So I read it in a different translation. Still the same result, or lack of a result. So then I read from the beginning of chapter 1 and all the way to the end of chapter 2, and I got a weird sinking feeling in my stomach. As I read those two chapters, it felt like Paul was the supposed author of this letter. Uh, was just buttering up his audience so he could lay a bomb on them later. But I knew that couldn't be right because he spent the entire eight verses saying that he wasn't here to trick anybody or to suck up to anyone. So I read the first two chapters again, looking for context, and I still felt like this was just all part of the exposition or the rising action. My English teacher would be happy I used those words. It felt like he was building a case as a lawyer would do. I kept expecting him to drop the hammer and lay it on the Thessalonians, which would give us something to understand and would give me a sermon to write. So I kept reading on to chapter 3, and then on to chapter 4, and then on to the final chapter, chapter 5, and the hammer never came crashing down. It felt like there was no climax to the story at all. There was a few times there towards the end where Paul would say, I urge you to do this or that, and I was expecting him to lay it on him, and maybe we would learn something, but instead, as soon as Paul would, say, would ask him to do something, he'd say, you're already doing this, so you're good, don't worry about it. It was very anticlimactic. Then there's a part in chapter 5 where Paul starts to talk about how the day of the Lord, the day in which we get handed over to our consequences, and it's very serious, and usually people are kind of angry about it, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night where nobody will see it coming. And instead of saying, you better repent and get ready for it, Paul says, but you, beloved, are not in the darkness, but you are children of the light. So the day of the Lord won't surprise you like a thief in the night. It's basically patting the church on the back. This whole letter was frustrating me because I was reading it like it was a roller coaster. I pictured Paul getting ready to raise his voice and make a point, and he would would follow it up with, Well, you're already doing it, so you don't need to worry about that. I was frustrated because I needed to get a sermon written for today, and the scripture that I chose two weeks ago is just part of an encouraging text, and I have no idea how to preach on an encouraging letter to a church. So it left me wondering, what's the point of this letter to the Thessalonians? And why has it stuck around in the Bible for so long? Uh, Surely uh, the Bible wouldn't just have some personal letter or fan mail to another church. So it also got me thinking, I have slides for this, but it's not a big deal. It also got me thinking, what was I looking for when I read this text? Why was I getting so frustrated when I wasn't finding what I was looking for? While I can't give you a 100% accurate answer as to why this letter is in the Bible, I'll try later. But I can give you a 100% accurate answer to the second question of why I was getting frustrated. First off, I want to say that it's totally fine to feel frustrated when you read the Bible. Uh, You don't have to feel awe and wonder every time you open up the Bible. It's just not natural. But it's totally okay to feel frustrated or angry or shocked while reading it because, honestly, it shows you a little bit of who you are and you get to understand yourself more as well. 1 Thessalonians feels like one big encouraging letter to one of Paul's favorite churches. It feels like fan mail. So I have no real reason to be frustrated by it. And I only felt frustrated because I was looking for something that Paul's text couldn't provide me. I'm going to skip through real quick. Oh, too far, too far. So often I find myself looking for answers that would allow me to speed along through life, kind of like I tried to speed along through those slides and get things as correct as possible and, and maybe get ahead of life. But in reality, this mindset makes me feel like I'm drowning in my wants and my desires struggling to keep up and catch my breath while my dreams and goals seem to effortlessly kind of run ahead of me. What I'm trying to say is 
For most of my life, I felt like I was running behind or I was running late. And maybe you can feel that too. But that's why I was getting so frustrated with Paul's text. I was looking for very clear and practical life advice, but all Paul was doing was patting the church on the back. And that's where I needed to stop. I needed to allow myself to slow down and be encouraged by this letter. Now, 1 Thessalonians is not very long. It's five chapters, and in my Bible, it was just five pages. So today, when you go home to cook lunch or to change out your church clothes, I encourage you to just kind of check it out. It's not very long, and maybe you can be encouraged for all the work that you've done as a Christian, all the love you've shared, and all the grace that you've received. So that answers my second question as to why I was frustrated, and that's because I wasn't looking for encouragement, but that's what I found. But what about my first and arguably more important question? What was the point of this letter? I struggled to find an answer for a few days, and maybe it's only taken you a few moments to kind of find an answer, but bear with me. And by all means, the answer that I provide is not the end-all, be-all answer as to why 1 Thessalonians is in the Bible. I'm not that smart, uh, but I do think it's a key layer. So I tried to unravel this by looking through a ton of commentaries and other pastors and scholars' interpretations, you know, doing my homework. And I started to look through my John Wesley study Bible, and nothing really stood out to me. So I went on to another Bible, another study Bible, which offered some thoughts on the eight verses we read. And they said that as true ministers of Christ, we should point to him and not ourselves, which I thought was fair, but it didn't really satisfy me. So I kept looking through more commentaries. I even Googled, why is 1 Thessalonians important? Because I was getting desperate, and it shouldn't have been this hard, but it was just one of those weeks. And Google pointed me towards a few more commentaries, and they all talked about how Paul was saying things to the church about himself. For example, verse 2 says, We had courage in our God to bring you the gospel in spite of great opposition. And the commentaries would tell us to have bold faith and courage. Which, okay, but that seemed kind of shallow for this message. Other commentaries pointed out Paul's words where they tell him that he isn't a fraud who just came to get popular or take their money like a televangelist. While others talked about that line that says, but we were gentle among you like a nurse tenderly caring for her children. And they emphasized how gentleness is often overlooked in our society. And I almost preached about that because that seemed like something I could do. But I still wasn't satisfied. So I prayed and I continued to reread the scripture. And then a thought hit me. What does all of this say about who God is? And that shot me down a rabbit hole that I didn't come back from, and it left me wondering why this wasn't the first question I asked in the beginning. What does Paul's life or his letter tell us about who God is? This thought spurred me on to read these eight verses as if God himself had written and addressed a letter to me. And as I read this altered version to you, I want to encourage you to maybe close your eyes or still your mind so you can imagine that God is speaking to you through these words. You yourself know that, as God, me coming to you is not pointless or a waste of time. And even though my name had suffered and my people have been shamefully mistreated here and in the next town over, I found the strength and courage to come to you and share my story, the gospel, in spite of great opposition. My motivations don't spring from deceit, or impure motives, or trickery, but you can trust my message because I don't speak so that I can please mortals, but I give you the truth. As you know, and as many before you have witnessed, I, God, never came to you with words of flattery or with the goal of getting rich off of you, nor did I seek the approval of any mortal, whether from you or from others. And although I've made demands of you, I, God, was gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. And so deeply do I care for you that I am determined to share with you not only the gospel and the truth, but also my own self, because you have become very dear to me. So what do these eight verses tell us about the nature of God? If the lives of Paul, Timothy, and Silas, the main characters of the text, are supposed to be true representations of God, the Father, and Christ, then that tells us that our God is a divine being who craves human relationships, which is something we see from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden all the way through to this letter to the Thessalonians. But while our God longs for relationships with humanity, God does not simply exist to please mankind and gain their approval, nor does God exist solely to take advantage of us, proving that we can place our trust firmly in Him. God does not sweet-talk us or guilt-shame us into following Him, 
And therefore, as followers of Christ, we shouldn't use flattery or guilt to coerce other people to believe what we believe. Our God has reasons to be strict with us because, I mean, honestly, how many of us choose praying or reading the Bible or loving the poor over shopping through Amazon and adding things to our wish list or reading our favorite book? Instead, however, our God is gentle with us, like a nurse who tenderly cares for her own children. And so deeply are we loved by God that God doesn't want to just pass down rules and judgment, but instead wants to give us a piece of himself, so that ultimately heaven and earth may overlap and become one like it was in the beginning. And God did give us a piece of himself in the form of his Holy Son, Jesus the Christ, and also in the form of the Holy Spirit, which lives in you and speaks to you, that animates you and sustains you. It's so easy for me to read the Bible, especially Paul's letters and other apostles and stuff, and and see how the authors are just men who are trying to teach me how to be a good, solid Christian. That's certainly the lens I was viewing Paul through earlier, which explains why I was frustrated. And while this is certainly a, a useful and worthwhile endeavor to read the Bible in this way, what I believe is more telling and more important is how we are able to learn about the character of God from the people who tell God's story. What I often miss as I read the scriptures is how the characteristics and traits of our authors teach us about our Trinitarian God. What can Paul, Timothy, and Silas' lives tell us about who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are? I think the scripture from 1 Thessalonians does an excellent job of teaching us about the true nature of God's character. If only we teach ourselves to look at the scriptures in this lens. But that can be really tough to do when you don't see the world this way. It's tough to see, our, see God in ourselves if we can't see God through the scriptures. And if we can't see God through the scriptures, it's really tough to see God in other people. But it's easy to see God in the scriptures when it says, hey, God did this, God said this. But it's more of a challenge when we read the Bible and focus on the characters rather than focusing on the motivations behind their actions and their words. You know, I often pray that people will see God when they see me, and maybe you've prayed that as well. And I think it's an important prayer, but I think it's equally important that we pray that we can see God in the scriptures we read, in the people we meet, and in the mirror. A large reason as to why Paul wrote this first letter to the Thessalonians is because he had, he had seen God living through them. And he wanted to encourage them to keep up the good work, and ultimately Paul wanted to join their Christ-centered community. Seeing the character of God in the scriptures we read will train us to see the character of God in the people we meet, which should lead us to love and encourage one another so that we can join them as a Christ-centered community. So let's let the lives of Paul, of Jesus, of the other disciples, apostles, prophets, teach us about who God is. God is strong and persistent like Paul as he faced oppression. God is pure and truthful, not manipulative or deceitful. God calls us to action, but he does so gently like a nurse would care for their own child. And God cares so deeply for us that he wants to do more than just give us rules for life. Because God loves us so much, he wanted to give us a piece of himself, so he gave us his only son, Jesus Christ. And he filled us with the Holy Spirit. And as we go through our lives, will we be able to see these characteristics in ourselves so that we can remember that we are loved by God? Will we be able to find these characteristics in other people we meet so that we can see God in them and encourage them to continue doing what they're doing and join them in their ministries? Earlier I said that I didn't find anything useful at all in my Wesley Study Bible, and that's not exactly true. I did learn one thing from Wesley's notes, and I think it sums up God's character, and it also reminds us of the goals that we have. Wesley points out that the first half of 1 Thessalonians, the portion we read, was written so the, lead, so the reader can witness faith working through love. And by allowing their faith to work through love, the people show their thankfulness for the gospel and their thankfulness for the ministries of the people who surround them. I hope we can all show our faith through our love so that others might see God in us and so that we might see God in them. And I hope we can continue to encourage each other so we can sustain the community that is centered on Christ that we've already built. So, as I end this message, I'd like to pray over you by reading uh, chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, just a little bit more than what we've already done. So let these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 11 through 13, wash over you. May God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus come and fill you very soon. 
And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as God's love overflows for you. May he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. Uh, I want to invite you to stand if you're able as we join in a hymn together. you take anything away from this service, I hope that you have a new desire to try and find God through the scriptures, but I also pray that people will see faith working through your love, so that you guys can work on building and sustaining this Christ community and a Christ community out in the world. So I pray that you go in peace and enjoy your week to come. God bless. Mm-hmm.